On this edition of Sightings, scientists move one step closer to a Bigfoot encounter. It's a very tough task to find one of these things. I think we're the people who are going to find one, almost certainly. A paralyzed boy prays for death. It was definitely uh, like I was possessed. A supernatural light guides him home. I came back and I was a different man. Then, alien abduction. Could you be next? In the beginning, I thought I was going crazy. I know something has happened to me, but I was in extreme denial. And later, these people have seen a vision of their future lives. I was a little afraid the first time when I experienced my death in this life. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. In business, competition and secrecy are par for the course. Well, the same holds true for paranormal investigators. That's a problem, especially for investigators in search of Bigfoot, who need to keep track of sightings and possible migration patterns. Now, one organization is trying to collect every report, footprint and eyewitness account into one communal database. It's called the Bigfoot Research Project, headquartered here in the heart of Bigfoot country, the Cascade Mountains of the Pacific Northwest. For the first time, Sasquatch is online, and every possible sighting, noise, footprint, hair sample, and anecdote is being checked out, cross-referenced, and rechecked. Already, the computer analysis is paying off. This color film was shot by Roger Patterson in 1967. It has never been proven to be a hoax. These are footprints shot on videotape just weeks ago. They were discovered in the same area the Patterson footage was shot. And the size of the prints and the length of the stride correspond exactly to the creature discovered 25 years earlier. One of the questions that arises is, um, when is one going to be found? There's no answer to that. Today, a week from now, 10 years from now, nobody knows. There are no guarantees. The way we're going with our project, which is a very sophisticated project, I think we're the people who are going to find one, almost certainly. The project is receiving grant money from the Academy of Applied Science in Boston, Massachusetts. This prestigious institution believes Peter Byrne deserves a chance to bring one in alive. It's not easy. It's a very tough task to find one of these things. We're dealing with something which is uh, shy, um, elusive, very wary of man, which has an enormous area to live in and to hide in, and um, it's not going to be found easily. While Sightings was shooting this interview, a call came in to the project. Independent eyewitnesses were reporting something moving at the base of Mount Hood. Burns' team responded immediately. They're clearly visible, and they definitely are primates of some kind. They are walking upright, and they're moving fairly fast. In the time we've been here, they've moved about 200 yards, maybe 250 yards. Analysis identified the two lower dark areas as rocks. Above these rocks, two shapes were moving at approximately two miles an hour. There were no reports of hikers at that time, but the distance was too great to confirm this as a Bigfoot sighting. It will be used to corroborate any other sightings in the same area. Photographs like this one come in every day, but Byrne quickly rules out all but a very few. This is a fake footprint. It's very square. You can see the line of the toes across the top here, simply straight, which is wrong. They should be angled. And then the sides are dead straight. And it's recognizable as a fake footprint, probably made with a, a wooden mold of some kind. This is an important videotape the Bigfoot Research Project is concentrating on right now. It's from Northern California. And um, it's from uh, late last year. And the, the photographers say that in here, in the, in the center of the picture there, just there. The dark area? The dark area. You can see something, and you can see something moving. Independent Bigfoot researchers Scott Harriet and Daryl Owen captured these images in Northern California. It was their first face-to-face -face encounter with an elusive creature they've been tracking for 10 years. I can see him pointing at something. After about 29 seconds, he then lowered the camera, looked at me, 
and started crying. I mean, he literally had a little minor break, started crying and said, let's get out of here. I was very scared at that point as well. We went down the hill. I'm crying at this moment, so excuse my voice. It's right here. You can see it. Okay. The footage has been analyzed at Wonder Film Design. Here, advanced computer enhancement technology allows researchers to take a closer look. Right here would be the head in the arm down this way. And let me rock back and forth here. And as you can see, that it is, it's something right there is moving while everything else in the picture stays static. There is something unusual moving in the thick woods of the Cascade Range, but the Bigfoot Research Project remains cautious in their optimism. Hoaxes are rampant in a field where film and videotape are considered still the best evidence. Especially in the 1960s and 70s, it seemed like everyone with a fur suit and a lot of spare time was coming up with supposedly authentic photographic evidence. Only a few pieces of photographic evidence have deserved serious attention. But even these compelling images aren't enough to satisfy scientists. I have to say that I'm a skeptic regarding the, uh, the Sasquatch. It would probably be, if we were able to verify its existence, the most exciting biological find of the century. Until we find physical evidence that's uh, indisputable, I think that all scientists have to take a, uh, a rather pessimistic view as to its existence. Wildlife biologist John Bindernagel is one scientist who no longer shares the pessimistic view of his mainstream colleagues. I was very slow, uh, very slow to come out of the closet, very slow to talk about this. I was concerned about my employability. Biologists weren't really accepting this as a, an actual animal. So I still remained very quiet. And I'm not sure why in the end I came out. I guess, I guess I found in the last few years, talking to people, that people weren't as disbelieving as they used to be. One reason may be the overwhelming number of anomalous tracks recently sighted in Washington state. Down through here, it's, here's a heel spot right here. It's about three to four inch wide here. Comes up across and here's a toe down through here. In this area. In this particular area, there, there are two that are hanging in this area here. They've been here for better than a year now that they've had people who have seen them. Skeptical scientists put Bigfoot into the same mythological creature category as leprechauns, fairies, and gnomes. But Bigfoot researchers ask, when was the last time you saw color film of a leprechaun? Have you ever seen the footprints of a gnome? Well, of course not. Bigfoot is different, they insist. He's out there somewhere, and finding him is just a matter of timing, patience, and luck. You would think that every inch of the Pacific Northwest would have been scoured by now, but since 1948, over 50 airplanes have crashed in Washington State, never to be seen again. If large reflective metal craft have remained undetected for as long as 50 years, perhaps it's not so far-fetched that researchers have yet to recover a Bigfoot. Coming up, a young boy's encounter with a supernatural light saves him from certain death. It was very dark and lonely, and that was just replaced by a brilliant light. What happened to Will Barton was nothing short of a tragedy. After a serious fall, doctors told the 16-year-old that it would be a miracle if he ever walked again. Will Barton believes that first angels and then a near-death experience created that miracle in his life. Will's transformation began here on the family's thousand acre ranch in Carmen, Idaho. They call it God's country, a clean, safe place to raise a family, a place that tragedy usually forgets. We were having a family reunion and all of my brother's sisters were together for the first time in probably five years. And we were having a really enjoyable time together. We had decided that we would have Christmas before everybody went home, and William was assigned to get the Christmas tree. Will and his friend Matt volunteered to drive into the mountains in search of the perfect Christmas tree. And just boom, I saw the tree I wanted. It was just beautiful. Will wanted to climb the tree and cut off just the top, but his friend warned him it was too dangerous. I didn't see any danger. The hill was very, very steep. The tree was very, very tall, and it was starting to get dark. It was definitely uh, like I was possessed to get the tree. 
After a brief, breathtaking moment at the top, Will's life changed forever. I just was enjoying the beauty when I could feel my arms scrambling out, trying to find branches, but I didn't have any control. I remember hitting the ground, but it wasn't very intense, like you might think. It was just like jelly splatting on the floor, and I couldn't feel anything. Will had fallen 50 feet into a steep ravine. His friend Matt needed help to rescue him. We were all in the home. Some of us were playing games, playing with the kids, and all of a sudden, one of the brothers ran in and said, somebody's been hurt. So we started putting up a search, and we searched, and we searched, and we searched, and finally we found him. Will's sister Julie and brother Brad scrambled down the rocky slope. The temperature was dropping rapidly, and there was snow. They struggled to carry Will up to the road, but couldn't. They needed more strength and stopped on the cliffside to ask for that strength through prayer. Will told us later that he saw several what he perceived to be white men, um, angels, so to speak, just come out of heaven and just carry him out, up the rest of the way out of the mountain. And it was incredible. Our strength was totally renewed, and we just went up the rest of the way. This angelic vision and his rescuer's renewed strength may have been key to Will's survival. Will was rushed from the scene to a local hospital, and the nightmare was just beginning. When Will arrived in the emergency room, he was uh, hypothermic, meaning he had a low body temperature from lying in the snow for uh, a couple of hours. He was uh, totally paralyzed, although he was breathing on his own. We did a portable neck uh, x-ray after he had been uh, uh, stabilized, and that x-ray revealed a fracture uh, dislocation of uh, the cervical vertebrae C4 on C5. I remember doctor, the doctor examining me and, and uh, saying he had a needle or he had to sharp something sharp. And he was saying, do you feel this? No. Do you feel this? No. Do you feel this? No. Will was immediately transferred to the intensive care unit at St. Patrick's Hospital in Missoula, Montana. The prognosis was not good and Will began to deteriorate physically and mentally. When someone is totally out, the chances of recovering are as near zero as you can get. He just laid there in kind of like he was in a trance, and I said, what's happening, Will? And he says, I'm just practicing being a vegetable. To me, it's the most single devastating injury that people get because they're locked inside a body, they can't do anything. It comes as a sudden thing in almost every instance, from one minute laughing, having a good time, to all of a sudden, oh, I've done something I shouldn't have done, and it, now can you put me back together? And we say, no, we can't. I'd pray at night, and my prayer was, please let me die. If I could, I would have taken my life. But I couldn't, I couldn't move. So I did the only thing I could do. I, I asked my mother. He says, if you really loved me, you'd get me out of my misery, and you'd take this pillow and put it over my face. And she just looked back at me with loving eyes and didn't say, couldn't respond. Will had lost all hope of ever being able to walk again. He became uncooperative and refused to participate in rehabilitation exercises. Then an unfortunate mistake changed Will's life once again. They got me on the tilt table and tilted me up way too fast. And I do remember I could see the floor for the first time in my, my new life. And I could feel the blood just running out of my head. And the room started to get a little bit dark and splotchy. And he, uh, he just passed out. And the nurse couldn't get a blood pressure. We couldn't get a heartbeat. I want to die. And all those prayers that I'd said every night were answered. It was very dark and lonely. And that was just replaced by a, a brilliant, brilliant light that just completely drowned the darkness. And my whole soul was just completely immersed in this light. Will says the light offered him a choice. To die and go where this light was taking me or breathe and live. 
he started to turn blue. By this time, the other nurse had gotten oxygen to him. And as I laid there, consumed by this light, with the choice to make about quitting, I thought about meeting my God and looking at him and saying, I quit. And I couldn't do that. And then his diaphragm started taking over again, and he was breathing shallowly again. I came back, and I was a different man. I could just feel my, my face shining, and I just glowed. Will says he was transformed by the experience that took him to the very brink of death. I've heard and read of these various episodes of people seeing the light and the tunnel of light and the near-death uh, experiences, and uh, uh, I, I'm sure that there's something that occurs. I'm not, I don't think we have any scientific explanation. Before the accident, William was very shy. After his, his experience, it was like the dam broke and his whole being came out and we got to know William at that point. I was gonna live my life. And the doctors kept saying, uh, you'll never walk again, Will. But Will's near-death experience had given him a new determination, and he began to have hints of feeling throughout his body. He moved his toe, and we were so excited. I remember running out to the barn, and t I'm going to my twin brother and saying, Rick, Rick, he moved his toe. And we just sat there and held each other and cried over a toe movement. <laughs> It was almost like every week we'd get a new phone call saying, he sat up, he's you know walking now, he's standing up. What happened to Will when he saw that intense light cannot be easily explained. His family attributes the transformation to their prayers and faith. Doctors have a harder time explaining Will's recovery. Conventional medical wisdom uh, would have said that he would be totally paralyzed uh, for life, and I certainly uh, would call this a miracle. If you define a miracle as something that occurs very, very rarely, I mean, it's probably somewhat analogous to winning the lottery. He's had a chance to have his life to lose his life as he knows it, and to have a, have it back again. And that's something that very few people get the chance to do in this life. Since his near-fatal accident, Will Barton has gone from paralysis to first a walker, then braces, a cane, and now he walks on his own. Doctors have stopped putting limits on what he may be capable of next. With his recovery in full swing, Will is on to the next challenge. He's enrolled in college. Next, is intuition more than a feeling? Is it a psychic ability we all possess? 25% of Americans tend to rely on their intuition. Intuition has been described as knowing something without knowing how you know it. It's also called gut instinct, a hunch, or even ESP. Some researchers believe that intuition is a spark and that many people can be taught how to take that spark and use it to ignite a greater psychic power. Intuition is knowing without knowing how you know. And for some people that means you get a flash, you see something in your mind's eye, you hear an inner voice that says, you know, don't trust that person when you first meet them. It's a way of knowing something that uh, goes beyond what we think of as rational, um, logical knowing. Author Lori Nadell believes this so-called sixth sense is present in everyone, and that a lot of people use their intuitive power without even knowing it. How you perform in the workplace is a good indication of whether or not you're tapping into your psychic power. Certain people will go in and, and, and they'll do you know, a lot of studies and they'll do time management studies and cost analyses and they'll get all this, the numbers and all the data and then you'll have somebody who's like a, a troubleshooter who's kind of a, a maverick and that person might go in and say look I want to talk to these three people and they'll talk to three people for 20 minutes apiece and they'll come up with a big picture of what's wrong. Long-term studies are now testing for intuitive ability, trying to determine if certain people are more psychically tuned in than others. 25% of Americans 
tend to rely on their intuition and 75% tend to use their five physical senses. Now the same studies when given to children, they find that 51% of children like to rely on their intuition for problem solving. And a lot of people come to me saying, you know, when I was a, when I was a child, um, it seemed to me that it was more natural for me, it was easier for me to trust my feelings, to trust my instincts, you know, to come up with, with quick answers. And now I'm always second guessing myself. I know mine was activated. I didn't realize that I had this. And it, it seems to occur for me in very threatening, life-threatening, fearful situations or in very intense cases. Uh, they're going to make the arrest if it was, of course, state lines against her, uh, her will, yes. Jane Finnegan believes it was her intuitive ability that kept her alive during the 14 years she served as a New York City police officer. Today, she's a private investigator. Or they went to bed and apparently everything was fine. When you have a missing person, there'll be a certain format that you'll follow. You'll uh, find out if they had a driver's license, if they had a vehicle, and evidence and, and things to lead you in an area. But I believe that what tangent you choose is generally an instinct and intuitive sense. I'm sure my boss would have like a stroke as I'm saying this, but it is true. Researchers now believe that women are able to pick up on kind of subliminal cues and eye movements, breathing posture, physiology, um, you know, pupils dilating, but very subtle cues um, that men may not be aware of. And out of that, they, they are able to come up with a picture that this is somebody to trust or this is somebody not to trust. So I've had a number of women come to me and say, um, this, is a, this is a fairly common story. Uh, my husband had a business partner and he brought his business partner in for dinner and I told him after dinner, Fred, don't do it. This man is going to take advantage of you. You're going to get hurt. It's going to, you know, you're going to get into trouble. And in each of these stories, of course, the, the man had gone off and hired the business partner, gotten into business with him. And a year and a half later, they found that the partner had embezzled or they were bankrupt or he had stolen or he had done something. I've come so much to trust my intuition that I really was able to develop my psychic abilities and I have since become a professional psychic and my home life is, is very exciting and interesting for me because my husband is a physicist and I was even in touch with people at Princeton, Stanford, a lot of big universities are doing work on what we already know. We already know this. Not everyone has the potential to be a professional psychic, but there are ways to better develop your own intuition. It's kind of like the old joke about Carnegie Hall practice, practice, practice. Part of what you're learning how to do is, is to focus your attention. Then you can actually ask your intuition or ask your hunches or gut feelings to give you answers to questions. Beyond semantics, is there a difference between intuition and ESP? Our experts define intuition as foresight based on some degree of prior knowledge, no matter how small that knowledge may be. Psychic ability, on the other hand, is foresight without any prior knowledge. Coming up, alien abduction, fantasy or fact? Either there's something very special about this fantasy, or it's not a fantasy. Could you be next? Then, have these people traveled through time? And a musical crop circle mystery. When the first reported case of alien abduction, the Betty and Barney Hill case, occurred in 1961, most serious researchers felt that it was just a blip on the paranormal screen. But since then, thousands of seemingly credible people have made similar claims. There was this big black triangle, just moving real slow across the sky, and it kind of followed over, watched it, and it got to about here, kind of stopped, pivoted a little bit, made a hissing sound, and it kind of continued on toward the north real slow, and I just kept watching it. I could see some little detail in the back, like little circles and a little square area, and I remember thinking, well, that's where, the, you know, that's where I went in through, was the bottom of it. Brian Kosky is not lying. He honestly believes he's been inside an alien spacecraft. He isn't trying to sell a book or get his proverbial 15 minutes of fame. He wants answers. What is happening to him? The experts have radically different opinions about the root causes of his encounters. It's what we call waking dreams. When people start to fall asleep, like on many occasions, they, are, they have a mix, a peculiar mixture of uh, reality and fantasy or dreams. 
and uh, in this particular state of consciousness, uh, which is an altered state, they see little aliens and they see spaceships and lights in the sky and so on. After working with more than 125 alleged abductees, psychiatrist Dr. Richard Boylan believes the abduction experience goes far beyond dreaming. I was pretty skeptical personally, um, but when I saw people who were very mentally sound talking about these experiences and having nothing to gain by putting them out there and lots to lose, I had to start taking them seriously. Dr. Boylan encourages his patients to draw pictures of their extraterrestrial experiences. These images often arise during hypnotherapy sessions where repressed memories are supposedly brought to the fore. Skeptics say these memories are unreliable, but in the case of Connie Smith, she not only has memories and visions, she believes she also has physical evidence. I just woke up in the morning and I did have that groggy feeling that, you know, that like I've been up all night, yet I got an eight hour, eight hour sleep. And um, I sat down on the couch and I looked down and I had a mark just above my knee and um, there was no pain to it. You could poke and poke, poke at it and there was no pain. And then I had a little scab in my belly button with a little pinhole puncture mark in the middle. And uh, for the most part, I just kind of kick it out, didn't think anything of it until my daughter came to me. She had the same huge bruise, which was not painful to her. Then I asked if I could see her belly button and I checked and she had the same thing as I did. Nothing in my psychiatric education, nothing in medical school, made me an expert on ufology and extraterrestrials. They either exist or they don't exist. They either abduct people or they don't abduct people. But that's not the issue. When somebody comes to me as a clinician, my job is to help them come to a point of comfort with their own experience. Dr. Rima Labo believes hypnotherapy may be unduly influencing alleged abductees. She uses biofeedback to achieve similar states of relaxation. Surprisingly, she's hearing the same kinds of abduction stories that have been reported by hypnotherapists. They appear to have been overwhelmed by an episode outside their own control and making, which leaves them in a post-traumatic state. That's very interesting. Either there's something very special about this fantasy that causes what otherwise does not occur, or it's not a fantasy. This was the craft I saw in 1973 out in the backyard. This is pretty much what it looked like. Brian Kosky says his abduction was not a fantasy. He has vivid recollections of being aboard alien spacecraft. Have these little silver panels that uh, they tend to control a ship with their uh, mind. This is the tail they seem to do their navigation from. I always saw those. I know something has happened to me, but I was in extreme denial. They can't tell the difference between whether it was a memory a real event or whether it was imagination and this is the problem kurt had been troubled by periods of missing time he remembers several episodes of coming to on his back porch not knowing how or when he'd gotten there under hypnosis kurt filled in the missing time i looked down the stairs to my right and standing there was a being that is very hard to describe. It's unlike anything I have ever seen or have since seen. It was approximately five foot tall. I call it kind of a pillowy liquid kind of being. There's no form to it. The only thing that even remotely resembles a human was what I believed to be two little black, like Raggedy Ann doll eyes that it had in the area that looked like its head. Other than that, unlike anything that I've ever seen. Keith Thompson is the author of Angels and Aliens, a book that tries to delineate between myth, imagination, and reality in the abduction phenomenon. Although he remains grounded in the laws of physics, Thompson still keeps an open mind. I believe they've had experiences of a reality that is somehow both part of our reality, but also larger than our reality. It's almost as if uh, my dog is sitting on the living room floor, I'm watching um, the, the evening news. I can follow what's going on in the evening news differently from my dog. When my dog hears the sounds, he hears the newsman and the reporter's voice, but doesn't track it the same way I do, doesn't track the content. Likewise, I think in, in re relationship to the UFO phenomenon, we're tuned into it. 
but it is so dimensional, it is so complex, and so much more comprehensive than our capacity to, to perceive it, that we can only pick out those parts of the signal that fit for us. And we do our best to explain them to ourselves, but we end up having to try to fit it into our categories, and I think the problem with that is that it just doesn't fit, it's a larger reality. I believe I've been touched by something that's not from this reality that we're used to. You're not just seeing something in the sky and saying, that oh, was weird. This is something that affects you all your life. I know it as real as I'm sitting here talking to you people that what has happened to me has indeed happened. Joining me now is psychologist Dr. Robert Baker. He is Professor Emeritus from the University of Kentucky. Dr. Baker is a researcher who believes that the alien abduction phenomenon is out of control. Dr. Baker, if supposed abductees feel that they're being helped through therapy and hypnosis, well, what's the harm in that? There's no harm in uh, hypno hypnosis itself. It can be used both for good and for evil. Uh, the problem is that uh, the hypnotist should not mislead both himself and his client into believing certain things happened that never happened or believe that things didn't happen that did happen. What advice would you have, Dr. Baker, for someone who believes that they may have been the victim of an alien abduction? What should they do? You should go to see a therapist who can help you deal with the anxiety and uh, the other aspects of your living that have been disturbed by this experience that you think you've had. Dr. Robert Baker, thank you for joining us. And we'll be back with more sightings in just a moment. Coming up, is time travel an amazing new possibility? It was very exhilarating, the initial impact of jumping into the future. Throughout history, there have been visionaries. In the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci was designing helicopters. Is this ability to see into the future a special gift or something that lies dormant within all of us? Hypnotherapist Dr. Chet Snow believes that he may hold the key to unlocking a visionary power we all have. The first step, paradoxically, is to forget. Forget your preconceived notions about past, present, and future. Allow your mind to ask the same questions great philosophers have asked since the beginning of history. What is time, and can I travel through it? It was very exhilarating the initial impact of jumping into the future. I was a little afraid the first time when I experienced my death in this life. That was kind of scary. I like the world like it is now. I'm not sure about the, the vision I saw of the future. I want to start out by having us take a few deep breaths. So just close your eyes. Their visions are the result of a process called future life progression. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, Dr. Chet Snow believes relaxation techniques and hypnosis allow his clients to transcend time and experience a possible future. It is essentially what we have found is that when you're in the dreaming mind, you can bypass this concept of past to present to future, and you're sort of in, a, in an eternal now. And so the mind can then look at the future and yet to the person who's experiencing it, it's what they're experiencing right at that moment, and so it's like simultaneous to them. Until recently, interdimensional time travel was considered an exclusive club whose membership was limited to Nostradamus, Edward Casey, and a handful of psychics and futurists. Certainly looking uh, for the future or hunting for the future is a very ancient tradition. And people have wanted to know about the future as long probably as there have been human beings on the planet. What has changed is that now instead of relying on a few psychics who have this extraordinary ability to look into the future, ordinary people can actually do a workshop and look into their own future. Now people can see a very personalized vision. We were supposed to die and experience our life in the future. But for some reason, it triggered me to experience my death in this life. So I wasn't really ready for that, but it happened. When I looked in the mirror, I scared myself, and I was really, really skinny. And I looked at my legs, and they looked like polio legs. And I think I was like dying of I, some disease where you just get emaciated. 
Death is an inevitable stage in any future life progression, but it doesn't necessarily end there. Both Michael Husband and Joff Selgis experienced a personal future that took them to the sea. So the year was 2150. I was working in a underwater station. There were tanks filled with fish, and, uh, and there were long trays of salt water that also had sea life in them. And I was a monitor of some kind. I had machinery, I had notes, and my job was to monitor the sea life. I was piloting a vehicle which went in and out of the water, up and down. When I went under the water, the water was very clear and blue. There were perhaps domes or something down at the ocean floor. I did look at a calendar and it was 2150. That was the year. Brainwave patterns recorded during future life progressions mimic those recorded in the dream state. But Joff and Michael believe they have shared a vision of the future that cannot be a dream. We were both very stunned to find that we both had had very, very similar visions. We had seen the same landscape. Uh, I suspect that I was patrolling the same ocean where his, his uh, station was located. We described the same uh, living quarters. So there were a lot of things, similarities that, that were surprising to us. Because time travel is an interior process, it can't be measured or charted. But while many in mainstream science dismiss future life progression as a mental exercise, they do believe in the possibility of time travel. In the realm of physics, time travel is possible in principle. Uh, if we look at particles and objects that are the size of atoms, they can be sped up enough so that we can see real time changes. For ordinary sized objects, people, rocket ships, airplanes, ordinary clocks, the speeds that are practical with current technology are simply too, too low to actually get any significant change in time. But after 25 years teaching physics, Dr. Jones feels there's much we don't understand yet. Personally, I think that uh, time travel through hypnotic projection or, or some other, other kind of mental gymnastics is a possibility because I do believe that our current notions about time and space as defined and described in science are not the whole story. I don't believe that we really understand everything there is to know about existence and time and space and matter. At least I'm open to, the, to these other possibilities and I do think they're possible. I personally am optimistic about the future. I think that once humanity gets awakened, then we will make positive and correct choices, and the future will turn out to be much brighter than some of the people have seen in these future dreams. Dr. Snow believes these visions come when the conscious mind releases its preconceptions about past, present, and future, and steps into the time-space continuum, a concept first suggested by a visionary named Albert Einstein. Hypnosis has been used to great advantage by a number of professional therapists. But it's wise to remember that it's also been used by a professional showman at carnivals. Before investing time and money in hypnotherapy, do your own research. Investigate the claims made by the therapists. Talk to former patients. And then make an informed decision. Next is an alien intelligence using music to communicate through these crop circles. All of the white keys on the piano are present in the crop circles. Astronomer Gerald Hawkins drew worldwide attention when he proved mathematically that Stonehenge is a giant celestial calendar. Now, Dr. Hawkins has turned his attention to crop circles. He believes that some crop circles display geometric principles so advanced they could only have been created by the greatest mathematical minds on this planet. Geometry turns shapes into numbers. Here's an easy one. Two circles, one inside another. The big circle is twice as big as the little circle. In geometry, that's called a ratio of two to one. The big circle is two times the size of the little circle. Advanced mathematicians, like Professor Hawkins, can figure out ratios for almost every geometric pattern. Where we see just three circles, he sees a ratio of 16 to three. Where we see three enigmatic crop circles, Hawkins sees mathematical genius. The circle makers have set up a theorem where we can prove by Euclidean geometry that the large circle is exactly 16 over 3 
times the area of the middle circle, 16 thirds. A very strange number, but it's exactly the note of F in the third octave. How can a fraction be a musical note? Different notes travel to your ear at different frequencies. C is wavier than G. The difference between C and G, like the difference between geometric shapes, can be written down as a ratio. Here are the ratios for one musical scale. Here are the ratios of eight crop circles Hawkins has studied. Strange numbers, but they're exactly the same. The maker of the circles is, we have to admit, clever, not only in making them, but in what is uh, encoded in them. One possibility uh, is that they're not humans. Is someone or something with a superior intellect sending us messages through these complex circles? Are these combinations of geometric patterns really combinations of notes that play out an extraterrestrial message? At the University of California, San Diego, Professor of Music F. Richard Moore is looking for a musical message that might be encoded in the crop circles. What I did was to use a computer to synthesize the sounds so we actually hear them in the precise relationships that they are expressed in these mathematical theorems. The first set of results is, a, is just a, a sequence of 14 different sounds that correspond to the 14 different crop circle theorems that I've been provided with. After playing the circles one at a time, Professor Moore combined them. This is the crop circle chord, and it's all 14 of these messages combined into a single chord that lasts for several seconds. Perhaps in trying to communicate things, between different species or different uh, types of, of intelligent beings, we have to rely on things that are very fundamental, having to do with basic relationships, because we have no conventional way of discussing things uh, when you, you don't know, you know, even the size of someone or what temperatures they like to live at and this sort of thing. Could the math of the crop circles and their musical properties simply be the product of coincidence and an overactive imagination? Fields don't naturally lie down in circles. Lots of crop fields have lots of uh, trampolings in them. Horses and cows walk around in grains of wheat and barley all the time. They don't leave circles. Circles are special, and that's why we recognize them. They are too special to suspect that they're there for no reason at all. Professor Moore's passion for music and his skill with computers challenges him to search for meaning in the crop messages that lie a continent away. He believes, though, that we've got a long way to go. The stage of development that we're at is, and it corresponds to a tribe of Neanderthals discovering suddenly a grand piano sitting in the middle of a field. And our problem is to discover its function. <laughs> and to learn to use it. <laughs> and it'll be a while, I think, before we figure it out. The idea of using music as a form of intergalactic communication is not unique to Dr. Hawkins. When NASA launched the Voyager space probe in 1977, among its cargo was a 12-inch copper disc and a playing needle in case the Voyager was intercepted by intelligent life. The record carried greetings in 55 different languages, a message from then-President Jimmy Carter, and 90 minutes of music. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-933-SIGHT. That's 1-900-933-7444. Each call 65 cents a minute. Average call lasts three minutes. Sightings is also online. Our email address is sightings at aol.com. On the next edition of Sightings, survivors thought it was the end of the world, an explosion bigger than 2,000 A-bombs, and now Russian scientists believe a UFO crashed in Siberia. Then, a grisly supernatural force may have caused these bizarre deaths. And you can't see it, you can't touch it, but a mysterious ghostly energy has been captured on tape in an exclusive Sightings investigation. That's next time. Until then, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, The Sentinel.
New episodes of The Invisible Man on a new night. The Invisible Man, disappearing every Monday this January on Sci-Fi. 